please have a seat. And we're, uh, today we're starting um, a new series um, after Easter leading up to the summer holidays um, in the book of Romans. And we're going to be looking at the, the first half of the book of Romans, so Romans 1 to 8. Um, you, God willing, we'll come to the second half, um, 9 to 16, um, maybe this time next year or something like that. Um, and um, so the, the title for this series is The Glorious Gospel of Grace. Um, and for those of you in growth groups, which are our kind of midweek um, small groups, we're going to be following along through the book of Romans. We've got um, Bible study booklets, which you'll receive this week um, in your growth groups. If you're not part of a growth group, um, you know, maybe you're new to the church or you just, you've never got involved, this would be a great time to join as we get going in the book of Romans. And you can always just join for this term, uh, see how you find it. Um, if you'd like to do that, you can see the groups on the app. There's a description of each one. You can get in touch with the group leaders or come and chat with me or, or Bruce or Lucas uh, about different groups. And Romans um, is a letter written by the Apostle Paul uh, to followers of Jesus in Rome. Um, it's likely that he wrote it about 57 AD and he was probably writing from Corinth. So I think there's a, a map. If we get the map up, you'll see Corinth there um, uh, down at the bottom in modern day Greece and, and Rome obviously in uh, modern day Italy um, further up. So he was probably writing from Corinth um, to the believers in Rome and he, he didn't know them personally which makes it a bit different to lots of his letters. You know often he's writing to a church that he's founded isn't he? So, he, so he's been there, he knows them. Whereas he didn't um, begin the church in Rome, he didn't plant the church. We don't know quite how it began, probably different um, believers traveling to Rome and sharing the gospel. So he doesn't know them and really he's got kind of two purposes. The first is to introduce himself and his gospel with a view actually maybe to being launched by them to Spain. You know, Paul talks later in the letter about how he'd love to go to Spain to share the gospel there. You know, Paul has a heart, doesn't he, always to share the gospel with people who have not yet heard. And from Corinth, he had plans to go back to Jerusalem to bring a gift that he'd been gathering, a financial gift. And you can see, if you're wanting to go from Jerusalem uh, to Spain, Rome is quite a good launching point. So part of what he's doing is introducing himself and his gospel to the, to the believers in Rome so that maybe in, in the future he can partner with them in order to get to Spain. And, and as a result, you know, because I think Paul doesn't necessarily know them, because he's trying to introduce himself, what we get in Romans is one of the clearest and fullest accounts of the gospel, the message of Christianity. And in a way, Romans is kind of one long argument, you know, one long um, letter. And, and for some people, that's why we love Romans. You know, we love following it through and seeing the logic of it. For others, it might be more of a struggle, you know, if, if our brains don't work that way. Um, but the second purpose Paul has in writing the letter is he's writing to a church which is made up of both Jewish believers, so Jews that have come to follow Jesus as the Messiah, and Gentile believers um, who, who've become followers of Jesus. And that was true in lots of um, ch early churches, but one of the things that happened in Rome was between 49 and 54 AD, all, lots of Jews were expelled from the city, and that included Jewish believers. So where they might have been very involved in their churches, they, were, you know, they had to go away. And what that has meant is that while they've been away, the Gentile Christians have taken charge, have had to run things, have started to influence things. And now the Jewish believers have come back and there's a bit of tension between them. You know, as you often get in these New Testament letters, the, the, the Jewish believers think, actually, we need to be following bits of the law. Um, you know, we need to still keep some of the Mosaic law. There's a pressure to, to, to make the, the Gentile believers, if you like, be sort of culturally Jewish in some ways. Whereas the, the Gentile believers are really... Um, focusing on the freedom we, we enjoy in Christ. So there's a bit of conflict in Rome. And so part of what Paul's trying to do is unite these two groups. It is, and actually, um, the focus of the book is the gospel. But those two things are linked. You know, Paul is introducing his gospel, but it's because it's the gospel that unites us. You know, as we see as we go through the book of Romans, the gospel, the good news of the Christian faith, means that whoever we are, whatever background we're from, we come to Christ in the same way. And that ultimately is what unites us, isn't it, and brings us together. So why, you know, why are we going to look at Romans now as a church? Well, I think one of the reasons is it's, it's a book that grounds us and unites us in the truth. It's important, isn't it, as a church to have a kind of balanced diet. And we've just been looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which focuses really on how we respond, what it means to, to live Jesus' ways. And Romans focuses more on God and on what he's done, and that's good for us. It's good to have both. And so 
you know, it depends. We'll be at different places spiritually. And I think Romans will bless um, each of us. For those of us that are still working out where we're at with Jesus, or maybe we've been in church for a long time, but actually our personal relationship with Jesus is a bit unsure. You know, Romans is a book that, that really um, enlightens us and shows us what it means to know God. A lot of people, their testimony is that actually it's the book of Romans that's helped them to come to a living relationship with God. That was true for Martin Luther. That was true for Augustine and Wesley. But even as we shared this in our growth group leaders meeting, people shared about how influential Romans was in their life. Or it might be that you're quite a new believer. You've become a Christian quite recently. And actually, Romans is a great book for really grounding you in the truth, for building a strong foundation. It might be that as a believer, you've drifted a bit recently, if you're honest. Well, Romans is a good book to get us back in the gospel, you know, to get us back to what counts and what matters. It might be that you're a mature believer, you're healthy, you're doing well. And you know, if you've read the book of Romans, you'll know it's a book that will push us deeper. You know, it's something there for everyone. It's a bit like the sea. You know, the sea is, is there's bits that are shallow enough, aren't there, for a toddler to enjoy, but it's deep enough that anyone um, can get something out of it. And it's, a, it's like that with Romans. All of us will be stretched. We'll learn more of what it means to be in Christ. But also, I think for us as a church, this, uh, this theme of gospel unity is a good theme for us. You know, actually, as a church, we're changing, aren't we? There's people who, lots of people who've joined more recently. Um, and actually, it's helpful for us to remember that what is it that, that binds us together? What is it that unites us? Actually, it's the gospel. You know, that's what brings us together. It's the good news. So let me pray, and then um, Olivia Spivey is going to come and read um, Romans 1, 1 to 17. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you that um, through it we see more of who you are and what you've done. We see more of your glory and your mercy and your majesty. We see more of the Lord Jesus and all he has done. And Lord, we'd learn all that that means for us. And Lord, as we look at this book together, our longing is not just that we learn more stuff. Our longing is not just that we'd learn about Romans. Lord, but we'd see more of you. Lord, that we would realize our identity in Christ, that we'd see more of him, that if we don't yet know him, Lord, we would be found in him. And Lord, if we do know him, that you would deepen our faith, our love of you, our understanding of who you are and what you've done. And also, Lord, for us as a church, we pray that as we go through this book together, both on Sunday mornings and in growth groups, Lord, you would unite us in the gospel. Lord, we would see the wonderful unity that you have worked in us because of the Lord Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Olivia, thanks. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit, in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness to how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I am obligated, both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, that that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. 
For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Thanks, Olivia. Um, now, I'm not someone who's quick to kind of share with people uh, about myself and what's going on. You might disagree with that, having had to endure lots of anecdotes along the way. But there's times, aren't there, in our lives when um, we have news that we can't hold to ourselves. You know, we've got good news that we want to share with people, with those around us. You know, um, maybe it's she said yes. Maybe it's we've been promoted. Maybe it's we're expecting. I'm getting baptized. I got the job. You know, there's times, aren't there, when we've got news and we want to share it with those around us because we know it's going to have huge implications in our lives. Now, all of those um, illustrations, they're quite personal, aren't they? But there's an announcement which has an impact for all humanity, something that has happened which is good news for everyone. And that's what Paul introduces here. So that our, our title today is Good News for Everyone. And the verses that Olivia read are really Paul's introduction to the letter, and first he introduces his message, so he introduces the gospel in verses 1 to 7. Then he introduces his, his purpose, you know, it's more personal, isn't it? His mission in verses 8 to um, 15. And then he really introduces the letter itself. So verses 16 to 17 kind of act as like a summary of, of what Paul's going to say. I wonder though, before we get into that, um, I wonder, um, just turn to the person next to you, what comes to mind when I say the gospel? When I say the gospel, what comes to mind? Okay, very quickly. Okay, the first thing that comes to mind. You know what comes to mind? Right, let's, let's, let's come back together. It's, all, it's always an issue when the answer's on the screen, isn't it? Um, but I, I don't know what we were sharing, you know, what that word brings to mind. Um, it's the kind of word we say a lot in church, isn't it? But, you know, what we think of um, might be quite, um, could be all kinds of different things. But the, really, as, as Paul introduces his gospel here in verses 1 to 7, if you're going to summarize it, it would be that Jesus is king. That's the good news which he is announcing. And he starts by saying this is the gospel of God. You know, he, he's making clear this isn't his idea. This isn't something he's come up with. This is God's good news. And the word gospel, you know, it's the kind of word that only gets used in church really, isn't it? Um, it, it comes from the Greek word euangelion, and it just means good news. It, it's, it's, it's the announcement of good news. That's what gospel means. And, and Paul says this is a good news that's been promised beforehand. So if we go on to the next slide. The point is, this, is, this isn't just spur of the moment. This is the climax of God's plan that he's announcing. And it's about his son. This, this good news is about a person, ultimately. It's about the son of God, God the son, who, who took on flesh. You know, the son, God, um, God the son has existed for all eternity, alongside God the father and God the spirit, the triune God. But the story starts as God the Son takes on flesh. And so Paul talks about his earthly life. You know, he became a man. And says he's a descendant of David. And we know, of course, by this stage already, he's talking about Jesus. And why is it significant that he was a descendant of David and he took on flesh? Well, God made some very specific promises to David. He said, someone's going to come in your line. And just as you are a king, they are going to be a king. But they're going to be a king, not just for a season, but forever. So here is Jesus, and he's a descendant of David. But, but he's not just an earthly king. So as to his spiritual life, or through the spirit of holiness, was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. You know, Paul is saying, yes, it's true, Jesus was a man in David's line. But actually, we see in his resurrection far more than that. He's been exalted again. He is divine, God himself, enthroned. You know, one of, the, one of the aspects of the resurrection, the ascension, that maybe we don't think about as much is that sense that Jesus owned. He's lifted high again and, and in glory. He's enthroned over, he rules over sin and death 
and Satan. So, and what's the climax of you know, Paul's gospel message? It's this statement, isn't it? Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in a way, Jesus Christ is a way of saying Jesus is king. That's what Christ means, God's anointed king. Jesus Christ, our Lord. That, for, for Paul, that's the good news, that Jesus is king. And it's good news for all kinds of reasons. It's good news because God's promise has been fulfilled. His promise to send a king who would rule forever to, has been fulfilled. It's good news because his plan is accomplished. His plan to deal with sin and death and darkness. It's good news because Jesus has triumphed. Good has won over evil. God's king is on the throne. That's the announcement. You know, think for a moment about what's going on in the Ukraine right now. You know, does it matter to people in the Ukraine who ends up in charge after all this is over? Of course it does, doesn't it? It matters immensely who ends up in charge. It will have a huge impact on their lives and their futures. Well, what about the universe? You know, does it matter who ends up in charge of our universe? It matters immensely, doesn't it? And you see what Paul is saying? Paul is saying Jesus is king. In the end, Jesus is the one who has ended up in charge. And as we think about Jesus' character and his nature, could there be any better news than that? That he, the gentle saviour, is in charge of our universe. You know, think about the cross. You know, we, 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 there's lots of different ways to think about the cross, isn't there? But one of them is the battleground. You know, that is where Jesus fought against Satan, against sin, and against death, those great enemies. And in the resurrection, he is shown to have triumphed over them. You know, there's no one now that can dethrone Jesus. He is king. That's the good news which Paul is proclaiming. And I wonder, you know, when we think about the gospel, just imagine that we had a newspaper. I know that we don't really read newspapers as much anymore, but imagine you had a newspaper out in front of you, and you were the editor, and you just received, you know, this good news, this announcement that Jesus is king. Where do you put it in the newspaper? You know, we might be tempted to kind of go to the back, to the culture and religion, and you get kind of half a paragraph, don't you, that religion shares with other things. Does it belong there? Or maybe we'd be tempted to put it in the opinion pages, you know, as people write letters or give thoughts. Does it belong there? It belongs bang on the front page. This announcement is something that has happened in history. It's news. It's an event. And I think sometimes in the modern world, we lose sight of that a little bit. You know, nowadays with our news, very often it's interrupted all the time with adverts, isn't it? We live in a marketing world. And I wonder if we're, we can be in danger sometimes of turning the gospel into a marketing gospel. We live in a culture of individualism, don't we? It's all about us. And of consumerism. It's all about products. And in a marketing world, how does it go? Well, here's a problem that you've got. And here's a product that can fix all your problems. You know, have you been injured at work? Well, there's a company that can help you. Are your bills too high? Well, if you use this device, it will solve all of that. And sometimes, isn't that how we represent the gospel? You think about a statement like this. If you trust in Jesus, you can be forgiven from your sin and go to heaven. Now, in one sense, there's nothing wrong with a statement like that. But there is a danger, isn't there? And here's the danger. That's about us, isn't it? It starts with us. Whereas actually we see here at the beginning of Romans, the gospel primarily is about God and what he has done. And here's another danger with a statement like that, is that we start to turn the gospel into a product. So Jesus becomes a means to an end. And we come to Jesus because we want something from him, the product, if you like, of forgiveness or heaven. Whereas what do we see at the beginning of Romans? The gospel, the good news, is a person. It's Jesus, the king. Um, one of the books um, that I'm finding helpful as I, I prepare is uh, Tim Keller's commentary on the book of Romans. Uh, if we have the next slide, and he puts it this way. He says, the gospel is about a person, not a concept. It's about him, not us. Or, or maybe another way to think about it is to think of it like this. I like diagrams, so I find these kind of things helpful. You know, often if we're honest for us, the big circle, the thing that, the paradigm that we think most about is, is my life. 
So you have this next slide. Is my life. You know, that's the, that's the big thing. That's the thing that dominates our gaze. And the question we're asking sometimes is, well, this Jesus guy, you know, will Jesus be a part of my life? We're kind of assessing Jesus, seeing what he gives us. We're thinking, will Jesus be part of my life? Whereas actually, I think Paul would want to say, we've got the paradigm wrong. If we have the next slide. The big paradigm, the big picture is that Jesus is king. That's what God's doing. That's God's plan. That's how the story ends. The king's going to come back. And actually, the question is, me and my little life, am I going to be part of that? Am I going to be part of what God is doing? Because it does impact us, doesn't it? You know, Paul ended with that statement, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the announcement. Jesus is God's king. And actually, he's God's king, whether we like it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we respond or not. That's done. It's news that's being proclaimed. The question for us is, what are we going to do about it? And, you know, we see here in verse 5 that what the response that Paul is looking for is the obedience that comes from faith. The obedience that comes from faith. And faith, in that sense, is a pledge of allegiance to the king. It's us attaching ourselves to Christ. It's us acknowledging him as king. But faith always goes with obedience, doesn't it? If this is our confession, Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, if he's the king, then we obey him. Then we follow him because he's in charge. And obedience here is is submitting independence on the king. So I guess the question for all of us, if this is the good news, that Jesus is king, the question for all of us is, Have we pledged our allegiance to King Jesus? Do we belong to him? Are we submitting to him as king? Have we come in faith that works itself out in obedience? You know, a couple of weeks ago on Easter Day, we had a wonderful service. We had five people who who were baptized. And one of the things that baptism is, is that public pledge of allegiance, isn't it? You know, this, in the end, our faith is not a private thing. It's a public thing. Because Jesus is not a private king. He's he's the king who's declared himself in history. And one of the things that that baptism is is a public declaration that I belong to him, that I'm in him. What about you? You know, it it ends. It talks about the Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Do we belong to Jesus? Do we belong to the king? See, in the end, that's what matters. So that's Paul introducing his gospel or introducing the gospel, that Jesus is king. Then he he gets more personal and introduces the mission to proclaim him. This is in verses 8 to 15. And, you know, Paul has never met these believers, these Christians, but he's connected to them because both of them are in Jesus Christ. So he cares about them, he's encouraged by them, he prays for them because actually in Jesus they're connected. And we see Paul's calling, if we have the next slide, you know, a number of times he talks about how God has called him he, he describes himself as a, as a servant of Jesus Christ, as an apostle. An apostle means one who is sent out. You know, the apostles were sent out as eyewitnesses to proclaim that Jesus, to make him known. He talks in 1 verse 9 about serving God in preaching the gospel of his son. He talks in 1 15 about being eager to preach to those in Rome. See, if, if the gospel is good news, it needs announcing, doesn't it? News needs announcing, proclaiming, telling. And that's Paul's calling. If people don't know that Jesus is king, how are they going to submit to him in faithful obedience? But it's interesting in this little section, we get two sides of that. So if we have the next slide up. You know, Paul talks about believers. You know, he's looking forward to meeting these believers in Rome. And he's looking forward to meeting them because he wants to encourage them. And actually he talks in, in verse 12, he says that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. You know, he... His intention is that when, we meet, when they meet, they'll build one another up in their faith. They'll encourage one another to follow the king. And then he talks about unbelievers. And I guess in the summary, they would be evangelized. Now, sometimes we can be, in the, in, culturally today, we can be a bit sort of funny about that word evangelism, can't we? But all, all it means, that word evangelism or evangelize, it's just the verb of gospel. So gospel is the Greek euangelion. Evangelism is just the verb of that. All it means is sharing good news. That's it. Sharing good news. 
And, and Paul talks about it like having a debt. He says he's got a debt. It, it, you know, it's as if, um, you know, if Rogerio gave me 100 pounds, but he said, Matthew, I need you to give this to Roshan. You know, until I actually pass that on to Roshan, I've got a debt, haven't I, to Roshan. I owe Roshan that 100 pounds. And it's Paul saying it's like that with the gospel. God's given it to him, but it's not just for him. He's given it to him to pass on. So until he's actually passed it on, he's got a debt. That's how Paul's describing it. And, you know, in one sense, Paul has a particular calling in this way, doesn't he? He's called to be an apostle in a way we're not called to be apostles. You know, he was called to go to the Gentiles in a very specific way. But actually, all of us are called to make Jesus known and to bear witness to him. And I think similarly, that's true with believers and with unbelievers. You know, with unbelievers, we're called to encourage. So that verse in Romans um, 1.12, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, that's the kind of our theme verse, really, for Connected, our young adult events. Because our heart for those times is that we spiritually encourage one another. And wouldn't that be good in all of our relationships, as we meet with other believers, both from within the church family and from outside the church family, If actually when we meet with other believers, that we mutually build one another up, encourage one another, help each other to follow the king, help each other to see more of Jesus. Do we talk about Jesus when we meet together? And and if we're, you know, if we're wondering how to start, even just, you know, the next time you meet with another believer, ask that question, how are you doing spiritually? How can I pray for you at the moment? Share maybe what is helping you. That can be a natural thing to do, can't it? Share what's encouraged you recently, what you've read recently. It would be great if actually every time we meet together, we see that as an opportunity to mutually encourage one another in the Lord. And with unbelievers, we also are called to evangelize, aren't we? To share the good news. And I think, again, if we're honest, sometimes we can see this. We go back into the world of sales. We? And we, we, we see ourselves as that kind of salesperson who knocks on the door trying to sell you something you don't want. And that isn't very attractive. But that's not what we're doing. Our role is to declare what God has done. We're to announce good news. You know, we're to live lives and speak and be be witnesses of what God has done. People should be able to look at us and hear from us and know that Jesus is king. And maybe a question to think about is this. Do the people around you know that Jesus is king? Do the people that God has put around you know that Jesus is king? Because if they don't, there's no opportunity, is there, to respond. We we can't control that response. That's the Lord's work. But we are called to share this good news. And then lastly, Paul introduces his letter. um, His letter. And in a way, verses 16 and 17 are a good summary of the message of the book of Romans. And I put it this way. God's salvation comes to everyone in Christ by faith. That is, God's salvation comes in Christ by faith, and that's true for everyone. So let me read verses 16 and 17. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. You know, maybe as we were just talking then about encouraging other believers spiritually and reaching out to those around us, sharing the good news, maybe our initial thought is, oh, I can't do that. I'd be embarrassed. I, I wouldn't know how to pray with another Christian. Or, or I, you know, I, wouldn't, I, did, I, I, I feel funny about speaking about Jesus with my colleagues or my family. Well, Paul addresses that straight away, doesn't he? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And he gives us a couple of reasons why. The first is that it's the power of God. You know, the gospel isn't just another message. There is power in the message. Um, that actually, as we share this good news, it, is a, it, it works in people's lives. There's a picture coming up of three peppers. Okay, now, they all look very similar, don't they? But if you bit into those three peppers, that middle one, that yellow one, is a habanero pepper. And so actually, once that gets inside, you're going to know about it in a way that you don't really know about the red and the green pepper. And it can be a bit like that with the gospel. At one level, it looks like just another message. And our world is full of messages, isn't it? You know, the the Bible just looks like another book. But there is a power in the gospel. 
that actually when it gets inside someone can transform them and change them and bring salvation. We've got to trust God in that, that this isn't just another message. Or Spurgeon put it this way, he was a, a preacher in London, and he, he compared the word of God with a lion. He said, the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. All you have to do is let the lion loose and the lion will defend itself. You, we can feel like it's our job to explain the Bible, to explain God, to defend him. But actually all we need to do is to share him and let him work. So, so that's one reason not to be ashamed, because the gospel is the power of God. But also it's for everyone. This isn't just our private thing. Sometimes we can feel like that, can't we? You know, that we should, this should just be our thing, but to put it onto someone else is somehow a bit pushy. But it's not just for us. This is the way that God has made for everyone, for anyone, to find salvation in Christ. He talks, Paul talks about the righteousness of God. And that could be talking about God's character. You know, in what Jesus has done, God's character is made known. It could be talking about his actions. You know, God's justice being, being enacted. But also, when you know, we talk about righteousness, it's talking about our status before God, our being right with God. And, and in the gospel, in this announcement of what Jesus has done, all three of those are shown. But notice that it's revealed in a person. You know, salvation, in every sense of that word, forgiveness, reconciliation, justification, the new life of the Spirit, resurrection, new creation, all of that comes in Jesus. He has done it all. And what we're called to do is to connect ourselves to him by faith. But in him... All of that is ours. And, and as we go through the book, we'll see that, you know, when Paul talks here about a righteousness that comes through faith, there's a contrast, particularly to righteousness that comes from the law of Moses. You know, actually, how, how do we find ourselves in Christ? How do we belong? It's no longer through the law of Moses. It's not because of a, a certain cultural or ethnic background. You know, whoever we are, and here it's Jew or Gentile. But look around the room, you know, we're from all kinds of different backgrounds, aren't we? and walks of life. Think of those living around us. Whoever we are, God's salvation is found in Christ by faith. So that's why we share. This is relevant for everybody. We can't keep the gospel to ourselves. You know, just last year, a man called Stephen Lungu uh, died. And some of you will know a bit of his story. It's quite a remarkable story. Um, he grew up in Zimbabwe, but he had a very hard start to life. He was abandoned by his mother when he was seven. Um, his story is recorded in this book, Out of the Black Shadows. Um, after he was abandoned, he, he lived on the streets of Harare. And he used to sleep under a bridge. He was illiterate. He was struggling to get by day by day. And he became very angry. Angry with God. Angry um, with uh, the, the whites who had a lot of power in the country. And he became the, a leader in a violent gang called the Black Shadows. <clears throat> and um, one evening in 1962, he, was, he went to a tent. And it was a big tent, um, a missions tent. They'd put on a meet, some, some missionaries had put on a meeting in order to share the good news about Jesus. And lots and lots of people are gathered. And um, Stephen went with a bag full of petrol bombs. He'd come up with a plan with some of his gang that they were going to go to the meeting and they were going to blow up the meeting. And they were going to go through petrol bombs and throw stones. And the plan was that at 7 p.m. he was going to whistle and then everybody would begin. But then he started listening to what the preacher was saying. And actually the preacher was preaching from Romans, from this book, about how we all fall short and need God's grace in our lives. The preacher then went on to speak from 2 Corinthians, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. And Stephen was impacted by what was said. He knew that he needed to respond to this saviour. And he went up to the front. And initially the stewards sort of tried to push him away, but the preacher said, no, leave him there, and kept going. Well, his mates, not knowing what to do, started throwing petrol bombs and throwing rocks, but Stephen remained at the front. And he prayed that evening, take me up, God, take me up. And from that point in his life, he was completely changed. You know, that message, that good news had changed him. And he started to share this good news with others. At, the first, at first, it was on the bus, you know, on those little minibuses. He got up and started to share, and seven people in the minibus also turned to the Lord. 
He, he, later on, he confessed to the policeman about what he was planning to do that night. And wonderfully, the policeman had mercy on him. And he actually sent him away with money to go and buy a Bible. And he spent, Stephen Lungley spent the rest of his life proclaiming that good news that had transformed him. Many, many people were transformed by his preaching. In, in 1994, he had the opportunity to preach to 250,000 people in Ethiopia, sharing that same good news, which had changed his life. This is the good news that Paul is excited about. This is the good news that, that drives Paul's life. And isn't this the good news that we're excited about, that we want to share with others? Jesus is king. God has done it. And we can be part of his victory. Let's pray together. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we, we praise you for what you have done. We praise you, Lord God, that your Son has taken on flesh, left the glories of heaven, and become a man. We thank you that he has been born a descendant of David to fulfill all those promises to send a king who would rule forever. But we thank you that he is not merely a man. We thank you that in his resurrection, Lord, it is obvious for all to see that, that he is also the Son of God. Lord, that he is not in the grave anymore. Lord, in that great battle on the cross, he has triumphed. And now, Lord Jesus, you sit enthroned as the king over all. And we thank you that no one, no enemy, Lord, can usurp you or throw you from your throne. We thank you that we know how history will end, that you, the king, will come back. And Lord Jesus, we could not imagine someone we'd rather have in charge of this world and this universe. Lord, we praise you for that good news. And we praise you that we are invited to be part of your victory. Lord, by faith, whoever we are, Lord, we are invited to belong to you, to be part of your people. And Lord, as we read through the book of Romans, we pray, Lord God, that you would just excite us, show us more of what you've done. But also, Lord, even today and this week, give us opportunities to share this good news with others. We thank you, Lord God, that the gospel has power and it's for everyone. Help us to trust you in that. And just like Paul, Lord, we pray that, that we would gladly share this with those around us, whether that's actually encouraging believers as we see them, whether it's sharing with those that don't yet know you so they too might come to belong to the Lord Jesus. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.